Good after <coughs> oh pardon me. Good afternoon from uh, New Zealand. Another live stream. We are going to continue the the theme of talking about adventuring gear. So for those of you who haven't figured out, I have got a series on adventuring gear. So that's what all this is about for today. I'm just making sure everything is working uh, correctly at YouTube's end. And uh, how's it going, Matt? How's it going, Sam? Tom Miller. Um, I think this is Fred's first stream I'll get to see live all the way through. Oh, that's great. That's good news. I'm glad to hear that. That's nice. Okay, you will find the... Uh, I think I can get rid of the earplugs, but basically you'll find the start time for this video down in the descri description once YouTube publishes it. Um, you won't be able to access the live stream if you leave now unless you have subscribed, hit the, uh, the bell button and turned on notifications, otherwise you can't get to it. Otherwise patrons get access to the live streams because I make sure they can. Uh, I do an edited version of all of my live streams, so I cut down the live stream, chop the front and the back, but it will exclude all of the Q&A, questions and answers, and feedback with those people in the live chat. So if you wanted to be, have that included, that won't be included in the, uh, the edited version. Okay, now if you haven't been part of my live streams before, normally what I do is I present everything first. I have just over two pages of material for today and so I'll present everything first I'll use slides you will see my face at the beginning and at the end um, once I've done my presentation and then yeah from there on we will have a chat about the topic uh, and your opportunity to uh, provide me with any additional ideas you might have so let's set it up so grab a drink and some food settle down wherever you are and let's talk about the glass bottle Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Wheeler and today I want to talk about Dungeons & Dragons 5e. Now today's topic is a little bit unusual in that I was almost ready to leave this particular topic off the list. I talk about Dungeons & Dragons adventuring gear and I was going to leave the glass bottle off. But today we're talking about mastering the glass bottle in Dungeons & Dragons. And of course, since Dungeons & Dragons 5e is the current version of the game, I'm going to try to apply it in terms of the application to that game um, system, but it could be applied to many different game systems. So I don't think that it's sort of going to be restricted in any way whatsoever, for those of you who are wondering if it was. Okay, what can you use the glass bottle with a cork stopper so most glass bottles will have a cork stopper. How can you use that in your Dungeons and Dragons game? There's a couple of things that you can uh, use it for. What I did is I jumped on Facebook and I asked the Dungeons and Dragons 5e community uh, what ideas they had. They provided me with a lot of really good ideas, not as many as I had hoped, but some pretty good ideas which I have included in this video and on top of that I've included some ideas that I found or discovered or thought of as I was researching for this topic. So it's a mixture of all those different things. The first thing I want to say is, as the thumbnail suggests, uh, number one, The Gods Must Be Crazy movie. It has a huge number of ideas, lots of different uses for the glass bottle. If you've ever watched The Gods Must Be Crazy, it basically revolves around a Coke bottle, a glass Coke bottle, falling from an aeroplane into um, Africa, essentially. And essentially, this bottle becomes uh, used by a tribe, and they find lots of different uses, but it becomes a problem for the tribe. And it's, it's got just so many different ideas that you can pull from. If you ever watched the, watched the movie, um, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. If you haven't watched the movie, go and check it out because it's worth your time. Okay, first one. Number two. Well, first one, number two. Yeah, well, can't be number two if it's the first one, right? It can be used as an improvised weapon, like a mace or a club. Now, if you combine that with the Tavern Brawl of Feet, it becomes much better as a weapon. So it could be used as a mace or club, but it could also be used essentially as like a dagger, because if you break the bottle, you now have a jagged edge. You have something you can hold on to, but you have a jagged edge or a sharp edge that you can use essentially like a, a dagger. This is going to kind of revolve around your dungeon master signing off on all of these ideas, but it's certainly one way of applying the use of the, the glass bottle. 
Okay, number three would be create a Molotov cocktail. That's basically a bottle that has alcohol in it and you have like a, a cloth attached to it, you light it up and then of course you throw that at your enemies and light them on fire. Burning the enemy is always a good way of dealing with issues, right? <laughs> in some cases, for some people, it's the only way to deal with issues. Okay, number four will be fill the bottle with small stones, so any kind of small rocks or stones or pebbles, and it can be uh, used to sort of be hurled at your enemy and act a little bit like a, a mortar when thrown. Now you could combine other things in with the stones or rocks or whatever, uh, such as an alcohol, or um, you can put a fuse on it if you want to, so that you got you don't just get the stones and the impact of uh, all these stones flying everywhere, but also fire as well. So you can combine the two ideas, the Molotov cocktail and uh, a mortar concept. So that could be included. When it comes to other types of things you can use it for, I've already done a video on how to use an oil flask and how useful that is in your Dungeons and Dragons game. So if you haven't seen that video, it's worth checking it out. But number five is you can use it to store oil in a glass bottle. And then of course, then you just throw it onto a target, whether it be a creature or a monster or an, an area, and then you're gonna just ignite it in some way. Now, I know people will say, well, that's essentially their Molotov cocktail, but no, in some cases you might not want it to set on fire straight away and you might want to have a bit more control over how it's delivered uh, but also too you know there's there is a use to just having the oil throwing it into one place then you have the ability to control when it's set on fire you might not want it to catch on fire straight away so hence putting the oil in a glass bottle makes a lot of sense and essentially you now have an oil flask so that is number five Okay, number six is one of my favorites, and that is you can put stinging insects like wasps or bees or other things that fly and like to puncture people's skin or creatures' skins. Put those stinging insects into a bottle, throw that in the, at the enemy once, of course, make sure it's corked, otherwise they're gonna come out. And getting them in the bottle in the first place might be difficult, I, I do agree, that, that could be a problem. Um, and then you can just throw it at the enemy and then watch the fun as they uh, get angry and start stinging your enemy. I was watching a movie, I think it was called um, Jack, um, uh, Jack the Giant Killer or something like that. There's a movie and he essentially uses a, a basically a, a bee nest, sticks it into somebody's helmet and of course it stings them and they fall off a high ledge or whatever. So another way of dealing with uh, your enemies using stinging insects. Okay, now if you're going underwater and doing a bit of diving, you can store a glowing insect for a short period of, period of time in the glass bottle and use it as a light source that can be used underwater. As I've said, if you get like a glow bug or um, glow worms and put them in the bottle, they will glow, but of course they've only got limited air, so they will only survive for a certain period of time before they die but it's a good way of having a light source that's underwater, particularly if you haven't decided to pick up the light spell. And I know a lot of people will say, well, you should have picked up the light spell rather than worrying about having insects in a bottle. And I'm not gonna argue that point because it's probably a pretty good point. Okay, uh, number eight is you can use a glass bottle, provided that uh, you've, you've been smart about what you're doing, uh, and that is you can use it as extra air with the cork on it, uh, when you're diving underwater. So if you're diving into water and you need to get an extra breath and you're running out of air, then just uncork the bottle, put your mouth to it and breathe in whatever air is inside the bottle. And it, it's kind of acting a little bit like a uh, a backup breather just for, I mean essentially it's only going to give you a, a mouthful of air before it's gone. Because once you, you remove your mouth from it, you can't really do much else after that, can you? This one I really liked, I thought this was quite clever, and that is a glass bottle full of water can be used as a, a magnifying glass, essentially. It can be used to magnify using the, the bottle as a lens for investigating small items or details that you find as you're adventuring. Now, there are other aspects to that which I thought was even more interesting, and that is 
you could also use this glass bottle with water in it to start a fire by using it to magnify the light coming from the sun on a sunny day onto a piece of paper and start a fire. So you can actually start your fire using your glass bottle and water and a piece of paper and suddenly you have started a fire. Now, you know, there are other ways of doing that and there should be a whole bunch of adventuring gear that you should have already taken. Flint and steel, um, tinder twigs, things like that. But if you don't have them, there's another way of doing it. You can use your glass bottle if you take the cork off as a makeshift musical instrument. We have all seen people using the uh, the blowing technique on the top of a bottle to make uh, musical sounds, so why not use it for that purpose? Uh, number 12 is bottles can be hung around a campsite. Uh, you make sure they're linked up to a, a trip cord or trip line, and that can be used as an alarm system when you're trying to sleep, have your long rest or short rest, to alert you to danger if somebody's trying to sneak up on you. Make sure the bottles are hanging close to each other and you'll need to have more than one. So I don't think you're going to be able to get away with just having one glass bottle. You're probably going to have to have a series of glass bottles so that they clank against each other when the, when the string or cord or trip cord is activated. You can use your glass bottle to store liquids such as water, um, any type of, type of liquid whatsoever, uh, things like acid, uh, any kind of knickknacks, provided the neck of the bottle is wide enough. Uh, even the venom or poison from a poisonous creature or monster. These are sorts of things that you might get to use later on if you put it, tip it on your arrows and, uh, and fire them at your target and then cause them a lot of grief as they start suffering the consequences of being poisoned and poison damage. Okay, number 14. If you take the, uh, the cork bottle, uh, the, bottom, the bottle's cork, and you cut it, and then you feed a needle through it. Um, you have to actually, you have to rub the, the needle against something, uh, making sure that you're, you're in line with uh, with north. So you need to have a reasonable idea of where north is to start off with. But if you rub it against some silk, this will actually create create a a DIY compass which will point north. You place the cork with the needle on a a pool of water and it will swing around and the needle will point in the direction of north and south. One end pointing towards north, the other end pointing towards south. So a good way of making a DIY compass if you need that for whatever reason. Particularly if you're getting lost and you didn't bring yourself a ranger along or somebody just doesn't know where they are. Or your dungeon master is using um, rules that uh, involve getting lost. Okay, number 15. You can put a message or a map in the bottle and then throw that into the sea or wherever and then hopefully it will be found before you die on the desert islands you are trapped on. Uh, so it's a, it's a way of storing a map or a message so it doesn't get um, water sogged or sludgy and it wind up being ruined in some way. So you're protecting your, your message or map. Uh, next you can also use your bottle in terms of uh, paper just to keep paper dry. So if you need, if you're a wizard and you have a whole lot of paper and you don't want it to get wet, or even scrolls, if you've got a whole lot of scrolls and your scroll case is not waterproof, then you can take all those scrolls or those pieces of paper or parchment, roll them up, put them in the bot um, bottle, and then put the stopper on the other end, and now they are protected and, and waterproof. And they should stay pretty good for a, quite a long time. I like this one for those of you who like to cook and bake. Number 17, a glass bottle can be used as a rolling pin. You're going to make some bread, bingo, you now have a rolling pin and no, you do not need to carry around a full-fledged rolling pin with you to do that sort of thing. You can also use that bottle as a way of pounding um, food soft. So basically if you've got a, f a food that needs to be crushed up or softened up in some way and you need to beat it and you don't have anything to do that with, use a glass bottle and bash it. Another idea that's actually taken from the Gods Must Be Crazy movie, which I thought was a, a nice idea. Okay, you can also take that glass bottle and fill the bottle with ball bearings to create a throwing delivery system for scattering those ball bearings on a hard ground surface at distance. So usually your ball bearings, you get like a thousand of them in a bag and you can hurl the bag, but you might find that hurling the bag is not quite as good as putting it in a bottle which has a handle that you can hurl uh, 
you might be able to actually hurl it a bit more, a bit a bigger distance. And remember too, when you have your ball bearings in a, a bag, there's no guarantee that the ball bearings will scatter. But if you have it in a, a glass bottle and they're all in there, when you hurl it and it hits a hard surface, hard surface, it's going to break and shatter and then spread all of those ball bearings across the floor. So that's why I thought I would suggest that idea to you. Here's a really nasty one, uh, number 20, and that is, you can break the glass bottle into a narrow passageway to create difficult terrain so that when an enemy that doesn't wear any footwear walks across it, they injure themselves or they have to move quite slowly to get past that location because there's a whole lot of broken glass on. We know what, it, what it's like to stand on broken glass. It's painful and of course you don't want to do it. I'm really hoping that this was useful to you. I have a whole bunch of videos on how to use Dungeons and Dragons adventuring gear, which you're welcome to go and check out. So feel free to go and check that out um, right now if you want to. Otherwise, if you want to support the channel, so um, I keep doing videos like this, there are lots of different ways of doing that. You can do that through Patreon where you get access to the live streams and other additional content and priority on the videos that I make. I have a affiliate link to the book depository on Amazon if you buy stuff online and I have a merchandise shelf underneath all of my videos. Uh, I have hundreds of videos for players and dungeon masters which you're welcome to go and check out uh, if you uh, have an interest in Dungeons and Dragons. I've covered most topics now. Uh, make sure to share, like and subscribe, hit the bell button to be notified when I go live and when I publish new videos. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s. Okay, I'm not gone, but um, just give me a second. I just need to chuck some glasses on. Hopefully my eyes are aren't too bad today and uh, we'll go through the chat so if you have any questions or feedback or anything you want to say um, chuck that into the chat now and uh, we'll get to you in a second and I will pull up my face don't worry it won't be just a, uh, a static image that you get to see I just need to make sure I look after myself and get some water in me as well okay uh, let's have a look let's flick it over there we are, there's, there's my face, and let's have a look at what we've got here. I um, already said hi to Matt, The Gods Must Be Crazy is, a, is like uh, one of my favourite movies, so um, I haven't got a copy of it, which really bums me out. I've already said hi to Sam Tom Miller. Um, hi Phil, how's it going? Hi from Germany, oh that's a long way off. Uh, put poison inside and offer someone you don't like to drink it. Yeah, well, I guess you suppose you could. Um, or you can just, if you've got a, you can use it to carry alcohol. I know that drinking in Dungeons and Dragons is something that people like to have their characters do, so you could just store any kind of liquid. Alcohol would be a perfectly sensible thing to do. I know one of my friends who plays a, a paladin. Um, actually, no, he's a paladin bard, and he carries many bottles full of alcohol just because it's easier to do pardon me i've got a bit of gas had a rough night um okay overboard dm hi how's it going darren um do 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 okay sam tom miller what do you got here i'm making a bullet listed um versions of all of these um adventuring gear videos and i will be taping them to the back side of my dm screen for my players to to be able to see during the games. Okay, oh that's nice, I like that idea, that's quite cool. There have been a few of my um, regulars who have offered to take my notes and type them out. Um, and I, I guess I suppose I could do that sort of thing, um, but it's like a whole lot of additional time, and of course if somebody else is typing it out, that's, you know, but then, you know, taking my notes, I've still got to scan it and send it off and yeah, I struggle as it is to try and get all these video com videos out uh, with the full-time job. And the new job is a lot harder than it wa was before. Uh, okay, what do you got here, Sam? Uh, you can put an um, empty bottle on your uh, on your fingers and click them together to get the, the warriors to come cut, come out and play. <laughs> Movie reference. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> 
Um, I think the extra air could be a bit uh, more useful than you might um, have implied as long as the mouth of the bottle is facing down when you take your mouth to the yeah I think you're right Sam I think that would probably make a lot of sense but then again it is a fantasy um, game so let's not get too caught up in the real world physical mechanics of how you would apply the use of a, a glass bottle in your game I know there are some dungeon masters who are very very strict about you know if it doesn't work in the real world it can't work in the Dungeons and Dragons world that they are running um, um, as I said, uh, you're welcome to ask me any questions, does not need to be or give me any feedback. It doesn't have to be about mastering the glass bottle or using the glass bottle as adventuring gear in your Dungeons and Dragons games. Um, Overboard DM, good video Fred, should be useful to for players. Yeah, I'm hoping so. For those of you who are wondering why I don't do videos on, you know, the best class, race, feats, uh, what else was there? Um, backgrounds why don't I do videos on that sort of stuff I tend to leave that stuff to Simon and I'll sit down with Simon and we'll make that sort of content um, okay um, what's this here bit irrelevant to the discussion topic doesn't matter I will talk about anything it's fine um, but I just wanted to say that I deemed for the first time oh good recently by doing Lost Mine and your series of videos on that really helps. So thank you. you hey man, you really. Th uh, do you know, I have to thank one person in particular because I made one video on the Lost Mine of Fandelva on my phone years ago. Or was it a year or a bit, year and a bit ago? And I was never happy with the result. Ah, oh, sorry, mate. It's Joe. Man, sorry. Joe. I had a really messed up night, um, so yeah, my brain is probably not working terribly well. Yeah, I think actually I've made that mistake a few times. That's right. I don't know why. Don't know why. Anyway, so yeah, what I wanted to say is um, there's a. I had a friend uh, called uh, uh, Mike Gent. I uh, believe that's correct. I worked with him at Mitre 10 and he said, look, I really think that people would find videos on the Lost Mine of Fandalva, you know, short form about different topics, really, really useful. And so I started doing that. And I, I, when I looked at it, I think, oh, okay, problem is if I talk about something, I need to cut it down into, a, into smaller chunks. Otherwise, the video becomes really, really long. So that's why I made that series. And that's why, as it happens, all of the other sort of uh, adventure running DM guides for something like um, uh, Horde of the Dragon Queen, uh, The Rise of Tiamat, um, uh, Dragon of Ice by a Peak, um, The Curse of Strahd, I'm going to see a lot more of The Curse of Strahd, those are why I made those series because I realised that actually there was a place for them. Um, but yeah, I wanted to get back to sort of, you know, video content on my channel and why I don't focus on the rules quite so much. Uh, what are the things I find about the rules and I want to make an example of um, I think somebody made a comment about a, a video on the player guide to the Lost Mine of Fandalva but I've had this come up with some of the other player guides and they'll say this is not a player guide for this adventure this is just a generic Dungeons and Dragons guide but I make it clear that I'm not trying to present spoilers that would ruin the game for that player or annoy your dungeon master. And then they'll say, yeah, but you didn't tell me what sort of um, class, race, um, background or feats would have been useful for that adventure. Well, first off, to do that, I would have to provide you with metagame information. But not only that, I would also have to spoil the adventure a bit for you to do that. And honestly, with almost all adventures, it doesn't matter what class, race, background, or um, feats you take. Um, you know, if they're useful, they're usually, usually they're usually useful for any type of adventure. The only exclusion I would say is if you have a land-based adventure, taking sailor as your background probably won't be quite so useful as if you are you're actually having your adventure on the high seas. So Lost One of Fandalva would be a good example. It's not on the seas, it's on land. So 
don't pick up pirate and sailor. Um, but pretty much any other background would be perfectly useful. A lot of the other races, even the the water-based races that you know benefit from using you know swimming underwater and so forth, they still have a whole lot of things that they do really well on land as well. Okay, what do you got here, Sam? Oh, pardon me, Matt. Um, have to go. Hey, no problems, Matt. I'll see you later. Um, Sam, have you done any videos about what to do with certain locations after defeating all the monsters? My group just wiped out the monsters from Cragmore, so they are like, do we just have a castle now? Okay, so you're talking about Cragmore Castle and the Lost Mine of Fandalva, Sam. Okay, so first off, I didn't make any videos on Cragmore Castle. And uh, the reason I didn't make any videos on Cragmore Castle is because Cragmore Castle is quite a large area and it's it's got a lot of issues and problems with it. To get through that location, because once you once you encounter something there and you activate a trap or you encounter some creatures in Cragmore Castle, for those of you who are not uh, players, this could include some spoilers, um, just bear in mind if you're playing the Lost Mine of Fandelver and you're not a dungeon master, okay, I'll try not to be too specific. Um, you'll find that once you enter any castle, whether it be the one at Cragmore Castle, all of the enemies in that castle will likely hear you and that's what tends to happen is they all just flood towards you so it's a difficult location to sort of talk about because um, once you once you uh, are discovered in one location and a battle takes place that noise just travels right throughout the whole complex and you wind up with everything in the entire castle coming down on you which isn't actually surprising because if you think about it it makes perfect sense um, if you've watched any movies, um, if you've, you know, look at the, the concept behind a castle and how they operate, uh, they've got lots and lots of different things in place. And the way they're structured, they're all made of stone, right? So sound bounces off stone. So clanking um, weapons and shouting and so forth, it's going to echo right throughout the whole location. Doesn't mean, doesn't matter if there's like a, a wooden door or even a stone door between you. Uh, a lot of those sounds are going to bounce and reverberate and, you know, Castles still have the ability, they've still got little holes in them. Uh, they might be very, very small, but enough for sound to travel through. Okay? Um, so I didn't make one on that. But if they decide to have the castle, let them have the castle. Um, there is, there is uh, another group that might, um, might come upon them. Um, but, you know, they could deal with them potentially. And, and then keep the castle. Why not? I would let them do that. I think it's a great idea if they, they get their own castle. It still needs a, needs a lot of repairs, though. Um, okay, what do you got here, Joe? Uh, my players are in the middle of Wave Echo Cave. Okay, unfortunately, they won't get to finish for a while. Pierce, the gold dragon egg is now um, strapped to the, <laughs> the Druid Barbarian Goliath's back currently. Okay, all right. So this gold gold dragon egg, um, are you going to be using the information that um, Fred Hubber put together that I put a, out as a video on how to hatch dragon eggs? Uh, are you going to use that information? I, I Look, I have done the hatching the dragon egg and people bringing up a baby dragon. Um, it caused a lot of problems I found in my game. Uh, and, and you know the funny thing is the player solved the issue in the end they said look I feel like the, the baby dragon's overpowered and I want my, pl my player character to have the limelight and have more to do so I'm, I'm going to leave the baby dragon at home it's a nice way to solve the problem but if you don't have a player who thinks like that it could be very interesting Um, oh, I'm going to bring it back to the black spider. Well, that's <laughs> All right, yes, okay, so I thought that might be the case. <clears throat> and remember, um, F. Hubber put a link to the, the document um, that he um, put together on that topic too, if you need it. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm going to lose my voice very shortly. <clears throat> I'm just going to have another drink of water. Well, I think, 
pardon me. Unless there's any more that needs to be said, and anybody else has any more feedback or any more questions, doesn't matter what those questions are. I think this is probably a good point to stop and finish up for today. And I go off and do other things. Um, and hopefully rest up a little bit. Uh, I still got to, I want to go and see the new movie uh, Frozen. Um, but what I will tell you is what I've been working on. I was going to work on a video for the Curse of Strahd for next week. And I was really close to doing that. And then suddenly it popped into my mind and I looked on uh, the internet and YouTube for this particular topic, which is <clears throat> telling a good story in Dungeons and Dragons. And there really isn't anything. There's lots of videos and lots of content that talks about writing a good Dungeons and Dragons adventure, but actually verbally telling a really good story for Dungeons and Dragons is completely different. There's a lot of different aspects to that. So that is probably the video you'll see next week as a live stream. What's that, Sam? I'm curious sir, to see how well they defeat it because I assume the Cragmore tribe is bigger than they have uh, seen so far. Yeah, you could certainly make the tribe a lot bigger. In terms of the, the number of enemies that they would have to deal with, um, I would just make the those enemies the ones that are stated in the adventure. But Sam, you know, it's your adventure. You can add more if you need to. And um, the Cragmore tribe itself is a collection of goblins. Um, so <clears throat> no, I have no doubt that there are more Cragmore tribe goblins in other locations outside of Phandalin. They wouldn't just be in Phandalin themselves. Okay, I think that is a good place to stop. So uh, unless you are real quick, we are going to finish up here. So wherever you are in the world, make sure to look after your family, your friends and your neighbours, although I'm very angry with my neighbours because they kept me up last night, uh, and yourself, look after yourself and uh, hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s.